think it's living on the dot. You're right. Yeah, uh, maybe we can kick start things. Yes, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning for joining us on this rather auspicious uh, conversation about the about COVID and its uh, responses, financial responses or financial management responses. Uh, we are grateful today to have our own senior fellow, um, Dr. Tia Champon, to deliver this particular webinar. Um, I've known Dr. Tia Champon for eons, um, I think since 2009, and I've no doubt that Thor is um, intellectual capacity when it comes to delivering on a broad array, array of subjects, uh, economics, energy, economics, uh, and all the ancillary, uh, should I call it, subjects that are related to these rather two important subjects. Um, I must say that he has graciously decided to have this webinar as part of his fellowship with Imani. But otherwise, he's a very busy person. He indeed is a very busy person, and we are very grateful for, to him uh, for uh, accepting to do this for us. As you all know, this is um, going to be, I think the budget is going to be read somewhere uh, this week or probably next week. Um, but otherwise, his presentation goes beyond, I mean, his solutions or his ideas are not just for Ghana, but also for most African countries that are struggling to um, to relieve their economies as a result of COVID. Um, indeed, it has been said that the IMF in its June 20 updates uh, estimated that the 2020 economic activity in Sub-Saharan Africa was going to contract by some 3.2 percentage points, um, which obviously reflects a weaker external environment and measures to contain the COVID. As we all know, Ghana itself had revised its uh, rather, um, not ambitious, but expected 7.2% GDP to almost 2%. In fact, the IMF suggests that that is likely to be depressed further. And I'm sure our colleagues, our friends on the IMF may want to make a point on that when the Q&A starts. Um, but you see, we also know that the several governments have decided to institute certain, what I call corona, alleviation programs and the Ministry of Finance in Ghana had written to some of us asking for ideas. Um, I recall that earlier in the course of the year, uh, Dr. Tachampon and Patrick Stevenson of Imani co-authored a paper um, suggesting that we should not squander all the gains we've made uh, for short-term thinking and short-term measures and they proposed a number of relief items that the country could also um, look up to. But I'm also aware that the government is looking for ideas beyond just the shores of Ghana. I am reliably informed that the president, for instance, and in fact I know this for a fact, that has been asking for advice on the Bernhardt Foundation, Greg Mills's Bernhardt Foundation, and they have been in contact and we've had some conversations on that. However, the implementation of fiscal policies to respond to COVID-19 will definitely be through public financial management uh, systems and primarily, as Dr. Tia Rompon has suggested, through the budget cycle. So this webinar is going to look at the ability of PFM systems to meet COVID-19 challenges in Africa, uh, namely supporting fiscal objectives, uh, finding offsetting savings or increased COVID-19 related spending, and the preparation of uh, uh, delivery of stimulus packages as well. Um, as I said, the the author uh, presenter today had co-authored a paper much earlier advising on what should be done. But I must also admit that this morning I did see two publications in the dailies. One from the Director General of what used to be the State Enterprises Commission, uh, admonishing state entities that they should be careful, they should tighten their fiscal belts. In fact, he lamented the fact that an estimated 1.2 billion CD dividends that state-owned enterprises were supposed to return is currently in peril and is most likely going to get maybe less than half of that. So it tells you what we are dealing with. So um, with these words, I'd expect that our speaker, Dr. Tia Champon today, uh, will think about providing answers to the following three general questions. Um, 
whether he thinks the PFM systems in Sub-Saharan Africa have been able to meet COVID-19 challenges, namely supporting fiscal objectives and the preparation and delivery of fiscal stimulus packages, among others. Second, whether with several African countries already revising their budgets, how does it think the fiscal policy objectives can be maintained in the mid-year budgets? And finally, how do we better target the spending to deliver value for money and avoid profligate spending, especially given the prospect of elections in some African countries, which obviously typically exposes our fiscal pressures. So as I said earlier, Dr. Tia Champon is an economist by excellence. He's also a risk, political risk analyst with knowledge and experience working with governments and international institutions on strategic advisory, regulatory, and commercial issues in oil and gas, energy, mining, and public finance. Um, he's been an advisor on several, for several governments. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at Imani, but he also appears and he's been quoted severally on international media, such as the BBC, Bloomberg, AFP, CNBC, and is published in leading academic journals. In fact, as I speak, he's currently co-editing the uh, Palgrave Macmillan book project uh, titled Petroleum Resource Management in Africa, Lessons from Ghana. I will think that with these uh, introductions, I'll hand over to Dr. Chua Champon to begin his presentation. We are grateful to have you once again. I must admit, and I must say that the, the participants are drawn from varied, various sectors, academia, business and government, and we have our friends on the IMF as well. So over to you, Doc. Okay, thank you very much, Franklin, and um, I appreciate those um, warm introductory uh, remarks. Good morning to um, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning uh, on this very uh, interesting um, subject. Um, i just like to share um, a few thoughts on the uh, above subject of uh, how um, public financial management systems uh, can um, respond to, if not the single biggest challenge that um, faces uh, humanity uh, today, perhaps next to um, climate change. Um, so I would extend my gratitude to you, Franklin, once again, I thank the wider humanity team uh, for facilitating um, the, the webinar and the, and the dialogue. And, and for the participants that have joined us. Uh, I intend to spend about 30, 35 minutes uh, to go through a few um, of the points that I've raised, and then we would have a, an interactive um, Q&A um, uh, session. So in terms of what I intend to kind of like broadly cover uh, today, um, I've kind of categorized it under four broad themes. Um, I recognize that some of the uh, words here are heavy, uh, so I'll try as much as possible to maybe break some of them down. Uh, so when we talk of public financial management system, what does that actually mean? <laughs> you know, what does fiscal policy mean? Um, what does that, or what is the relationship between that um, and like, you know, uh, media, medium term budgeting? And then a few of how um, the governments have responded so far to uh, the um, twin crisis of, of COVID, but also the um, commodities price you know, uh, fall that we have seen in a number of the countries that um, are commodity or resource um, are dependent. So let me quickly um, start off my conversation with, with a bit of a snapshot of where we are. Um, globally today uh, on on uh, on COVID, um, I said when I put this data up uh, just about two days ago, we were a little shy of 13 million cases worldwide, uh, of which uh, under 600,000 people unfortunately um, have have died, uh, with all the lost potential productivity uh, that uh, has gone um, waste uh, as a result. But if you see on the on the map here, you can see that some regions have been um, impacted on the um, health front, perhaps a bit more severely uh, than than others. So Africa relatively has uh, 
had cases in the um, 100 to just around the 10,000, 20,000 uh, range on average. Um, there are some countries that actually have, you know, recorded close to uh, about 100 or 2,000 um, cases upwards. Um, um, and as a result of the uh, of the crisis that we uh, we have witnessed, we are also seeing a corollary impact on a lot of these um, you know uh, uh, economies uh, in across the globe, but particularly in sub-Saharan um, uh, Africa uh, as well. So the ongoing pandemic has actually triggered quite a bit of a big response uh, from across across the board. And I just mentioned that we live in a time, you know, like like no no other. And if you look at several of the forecasts that have been put out, and here I just took uh, the forecast from the uh, IMF's World Economic Outlook in um, April of last year, you could actually see, you know, quite a, a significant um, drop in uh, in economic activity measured by uh, global GDP. And if you look at a lot of the equity market indices, likewise, they, uh, you know, have also uh, uh, fallen. Now, there's question marks uh, still on what we're expecting in terms of the recovery, whether it will be a, a V-shaped, a quick downturn and an uptick, or a U-shaped, or even these days I hear things about uh, a square root um, uh, um, recovery on the, on the, on the horizon. So with the cases um, and fatalities rising, a lot of policymakers have been uh, forced to spend uh, to mitigate the um, impact of, of the crisis. Uh, if you look at the latest numbers, at, as much as $11 trillion worldwide has been um, pumped into mitigating the um, effect of, of the crisis uh, across across the ac across the, the the globe, and this uh, trajectory is nonetheless or uh, no different from what we're seeing um, in in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in fact, a lot of the sub-Saharan and African economies are forecasted to witness quite significant or sharp uh, contractions, more so than um, other economies globally. Partly because you know uh, in the last commodities uh, super cycle or boom that we had from about 2000 to 2014 when the oil price came down. There was a lot of uh, revenues uh, that inflowed into a lot of these uh, African countries, but uh, the diversification efforts has been um, quite weak. So sometimes all it takes is just one extra or exogenous shock to these uh, economies uh, for uh, us to undo uh, a couple of years of uh, gains that have been made. So as you can see on the chart on your left-hand side, this was what the um, IMF and some other multilateral bodies were forecasting in terms of outlook back in October of, of last year. And you can see a number of the countries were actually in the green or are green colored, uh, doing uh, between three to 6% um, GDP growth uh, for uh, 2020 and, and beyond. But the environment has changed. And the change in the environment is what you see on the right hand uh, chart here, where suddenly we actually are looking at far less uh, uh, in terms of the, of the growth, for, growth forecast uh, for uh, these uh, sub-Saharan African um, uh, uh, economies. So we are looking around about 3.2 or just around 3%. Um, contraction uh, in GDP growth for Sub-Saharan Africa for 2020. But the shape of the recovery going into 21, 22, it's all dependent on also what happens, you know, at the, at the global level in terms of whether we're expecting a V or a U-shaped uh, uh, or even a square root recovery. I, I think that we're actually going to bottom out a little bit more. So the recovery is likely to be a bit more of a U-shaped. So we have to uh, while away a little bit more of time as we especially are expecting in some uh, economies or in some places, a second wave of, of infections in the absence of a, 
um, a vaccine being found to uh, to deal with uh, with uh, with uh, with the virus. So the response to the to the crisis so far globally has been uh, through two main um, channels. On the fiscal side, which is the the tax you know side of things, we've seen a number of countries you know adopt things like. Uh, um, reducing um, uh, VAT, reducing corporate income tax, um, trying to control non-priority um, expenditure or redirect expenditure into like, you know, healthcare uh, spending. We've seen um, uh, some targeted social um, infrastructure spending, um, tax holidays to SMEs, all of that on the, on the fiscal side. And this is across the board globally, but also in 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 um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a, in the next you know few few slides. And then on the monetary macro financial aspect of of things, we have seen a number of the central banks uh, um, reacting to reduce the uh, the policy rate um, and also um, lower or reduce uh, some of the primary reserve requirements uh, for uh, the uh, commercial uh, banks, uh, all in a bid towards creating more liquidity um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the system. On the macro financial aspect, some of the central banks in Sub-Saharan Africa, like the um, Ghanaian Central Bank, um, has even had a, sw a swap or a, you know, FX uh, repo arrangement with the US Fed that allows them to access up to about a billion dollars of, um, uh, of, of Forex USD coming in uh, to uh, prop up uh, the, the local um, uh, currency. So that has been the, the response to uh, this uh, crisis overall across the board in, um, in uh, a number of the, of the countries. However, the scale, uh, I'll just skip uh, one more slide. However, what we have seen is that despite these um, interventions, i.e. the fiscal and then the macro side, a lot of the countries uh, on, the, on the continent have or are facing significant um, funding gaps. And therefore they've had to resort to some of the um, traditional multilateral lenders in addition to uh, trying to renegotiate uh, some of the debt repayments um, to create a bit more um, uh, fiscal space. So what you see on this chart here is um, the number of countries across the world that have uh, approached the IMF for um, various um, uh, credit support uh, in instruments. What is interesting in this chart here that you could see quite uh, a lot of the countries that have approached the fund are actually in Sub-Saharan um, uh, Africa. At the last count, I think about 29 or 30 of the 52 African countries. So just a little over half of the African countries have approached uh, the uh, IMF for one form of, uh, of funding or the other and uh, things like the um, uh, rapid credit facility, uh, rapid financing instrument, and then a few other um, uh, funding um, uh, pro protoc protocols as well. Um, and part of the reason is because of the, the demand shocks that have been caused by the, uh, the, the, the pandemic um, and due to the demand shock and also on the external kind of supply side, um, FX earnings uh, from uh, commodity exports have reduced. We've seen uh, remittances uh, also um, declining, tourism, all of that have all combined to create a much more onerous or difficult uh, financing um, environment for uh, a number of these uh, sub-Saharan um, uh, African countries. And I just mentioned a few minutes ago that, um, could you please mute uh, if the moderator could mute uh, wow. others because it's a bit of a background noise. Yes, uh, please. Um, could you all mute your microphones so that I don't have to do that myself? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I mentioned a few slides ago that part of the reason why we see 
a lot of African countries also approaching, you know, or having this love-hate relationship with uh, the multilateral lenders is that in times when we've had uh, commodity super cycles, uh, we haven't really used those resources as efficiently um, enough. And we even haven't invested into the core um, social um, uh, aspects of the country. So what COVID has done is further expose or deepen some of these uh, existing cracks in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the system. And part of the reason uh, it, in, in relation to this is to do with a number of the structural rigidities uh, in the budget in a lot of African countries. Let me explain that with the example of Ghana and I'll tie that into why PFM matters and what we can actually do uh, with PFM to uh, create a bit more fiscal space and, and, um, and funding in a post-COVID uh, outlook. But the example on here just shows you the uh, 2020 um, budget proposals for Ghana. So on your left-hand side here chart is what the government was uh, proposing to re uh, mobilize uh, as uh, resources for 2020. I've converted this to a USD, but in total, they're expecting to mobilize a little over 11 and a half billion um, dollars of, of revenue um, as against expending of uh, 14.8 um, billion dollars. And the revenue mobilization was coming, is coming in from a number of fronts, but I just wanna focus a bit on the expenditure side of the of the equation and where we begin to see where why some of these cracks or COVID has exposed um, some of the uh, socioeconomic cracks that we have to uh, have to deal with. So if you look at like the um, expenditure pattern of the 14.8 or so billion, um, just 4.5 billion is being paid or your top three budget items are to pay for uh, employees, government employees. Uh, after that, you pay for, uh, or you service the interest payments uh, from the uh, com uh, both commercial and non-commercial debt that the, uh, the country has. And then there's some earmarked funding uh, or grants uh, to some of the government units and parastatals. When you take off these first three line items, you begin to realize that pretty much all of your budget is, is actually gone. So your revenue mobilization of 11.5 billion would take care of your compensation of employees, interest payments and grants. And there's nothing left for capital expenditure or um, you know, goods and services or you know, some of the uh, other expenditure uh, budget uh, items. And this is actually the case in a number of uh, countries that when you, you look at in, in Sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa and has been for as long as I can remember. So uh, I've been looking at like some of the structural adjustment programs and the outcomes of that um, in, in, in a number of these countries. And if you look at the budget patterns going back, you know, 20 years, you can pretty much predict this, you know, sort of uh, pattern across the board, where um, after you pay uh, government workers, you service debt, you know, you, you pay uh, the, the government entities their grant, you have very little left to actually uh, invest in um, the, uh, the core um, uh, social aspects uh, of, of, of the people or the, uh, the economy. And you can see it in, in another way, I'll illustrate it in, in, in another way with, with this uh, fishbone that I, I have put on here. So this is from an exercise that we did uh, about a year and a half ago uh, for a, a DFID project uh, in, in a response to the Ghana Beyond Aid um, initiative where the government in Ghana is thinking about self-financing its uh, development uh, little did we know that actually COVID would even precipitate or make that even more um, imperative. So let me go back to, you know, contextualize what I said in the last slide with, with this example here. Um, so yes, we've collected revenue or resources. The budgets are constrained in terms of structural rigidities. 
But even in terms of the spending itself, what we found that in a lot of the cases, so this was right at the top or at the center of, of government, there's a lot of inefficiency in spending. So that's the first, uh, this bubble here on your left-hand side. And there's very little um, value for money in especially the social sector. So this is health, education, and social protection. And, and these are the sectors that typically tend to be heavily impacted when you tend to have, you know, crises such as uh, COVID. And these sectors then, because of the inefficiency of spending and the low value for money, you, it, it would constrain any sort of uh, path to self-reliance uh, that uh, uh, the country uh, is seeking uh, to, uh, to, to attain. And the root causes of this, uh, without going through all of that, but at the root cause of it, I'll just pick one at the top, uh, the top half of this fishbone is that there's quite you know weak strategic planning, and even when it comes to budget formulation, there there are significant um, issues in there. I'll pick another point. It cuts across the board. This is a Ghana example, but it's very applicable to uh, uh, a number of sub-Saharan African countries. That the procurement planning often is is poor, and we tend to see a lot of uh, sole sourcing uh, contracts. Uh, you know over the years that uh, we were, we were uh, looking at that from. Um, third thing is things like the integrated financial management system, GIFMIS, et cetera, had not been fully rolled out to a number of the subnationals and the um, uh, M -M 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 MDAs. And at the core of this, this is pretty much your PFM system and how you allocate those resources to um, uh, attain or to meet the uh, budget objectives and and the out and the and the and then the outcome. So what COVID has shown and would indicate to us is that we need to be better at our spending. We need to be better at connecting um, spending, not in terms of just inputs, uh, but you know connect that to to outcomes. So you would see. I'll show you in a couple of slides that we keep a lot more money. Even in these uh, social sectors, we keep pumping far, far more money in there, but there's very little being translated in terms of uh, in terms of uh, of outcomes. Um, you can see that with an extra example here in the healthcare sector, um, another fishbone. So the problem we identified was that the government uh, was actually unable to deliver on universal healthcare. Why? Because there's weak procurement management, there's weak financial management, there's inefficient resource mobilization, there is you know, poor coordination and service organization across the MDA. So what you see consistently across the board is whether you're looking at it at the level of government or you're looking at it at the level of like a ministry or sub-national, these problems tend to be replicated um, across the board. Um, but with COVID, we are looking at a constrained fiscal space. Already we had a constrained fiscal space, as I showed you, and now we're not going to be getting a lot of like the um, F FDI and the revenue, revenue inflows, at least in the kind of medium term to about 2022, 2023, they're about. So the imperative here is that we have to do more with, uh, with less. And the question then is how, which is what I want to um, kind of move to in the, in the next, uh, a uh, couple of, of, of slides. So I, I talked about um, uh, spending on inputs without a correlation to, uh, to, uh, to outcomes. Um, the problem can, you can see that in, in this little chart here. So here I just put two charts, one which looks at the um, health expenditure per capita uh, in, in, in Ghana, but uh, I also put Sub-Saharan Africa there, and then correlate that to a uh, life expectancy uh, um, uh, across the board. Um, what you can see is between um, 2000 to just around like 2013 or 14 thereabouts, uh, in the example of Ghana, to illustrate the point, we had a 552% increase in our health expenditure per capita 
in nominal terms from $17 to $111. So uh, the state was spending on average $111 per person um, on every um, citizen uh, from $17 um, uh, uh, in, in about you know, uh, the 10 or 12 year period up to 2013. Um, that has reduced marginally now to around $67 uh, a barrel. But if you actually look at life expectancy, that has moved or increased only about two years in the same um, period. So life expectancy uh, in uh, 2010 was about 61 years. In 2017, where the latest data ends, it's just around 63.46 years. And if you go back to uh, 2000, life expectancy was 57 years. Um, which raises kind of an obvious question. If we are spending more and more money um, with the letter that we've got you know, in these sectors, then how come we're not seeing as, as much of a bigger impact you know, in terms of some of these um, outcome indicators? And I posit that perhaps we framed the approach to the problem a bit wrongly where we are always focused on um, inputs, so okay, if you've got a problem here, let's build more hospitals, let's build uh, more roads, but they're not integrated in a manner that connects to you know, the broader output of what we actually want uh, for uh, the, the, the nation or, or, or the state. And this is going to be exactly uh, pertinent, especially in a post-COVID world where I mentioned a, a few moments ago that we have to do far, far, far more with the resources that, that we have. Um, it's encapsulated in this nice statement from the, um, the finance minister in Ghana, when he says, uh, or he said back in October of 2017, and I quote that the government is committed to crack it, cracking down on financial malpractices and wasteful public spending. Hence the priority on achieving the target set out in the uh, public financial management um, strategy. So let me just then quickly go into you know, the PFM itself and I'm spending a bit of minutes here and, and tie uh, the points uh, down and I would, I would then um, stop and we can have a, a discussion or uh, um, a, a, com a, a conversation around, around, around that. So typically when you hear of uh, PFM, um, it sounds quite big itself, but it really is not much. Uh, public financial management uh, more broadly is just a set of the laws, the regulations, protocols, processes um, that are used to manage um, public uh, resources. And that is encapsulated by the, um, by the, uh, the, 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 the budget cycles. Um, so it's very much interdisciplinary it's a function of accounting, economics, law, IT, or management information system. And it's practically essential for kind of three main reasons. Number one, for uh, creation of or assessing the fiscal space for sustainability and for uh, and accountability. And how this is done or executed is through the budget cycle. So what I have here on this chart it's just uh, the budget cycle with the various um, stages from when policy pronouncements or proposals are made to when uh, it is actually executed um, um, in, in terms of the budget, right the way through to getting um, the uh, budgets approved, to executing the budget, uh, accounting, um, and um, an external audit. But I want to delve and look at two or three component parts in this cycle to talk about COVID and the COVID response and how the PFM system, you know, uh, perhaps can be better strengthened to meet, you know, um, the, uh, the current response to the crisis, but also in a post COVID world, you know, uh, have, allowing us to do uh, much, much more uh, with, with less uh, uh, resources. Um, so I want to, I will skip over the, the policy and the formulation bit. Uh, the slides will be shared uh, a bit uh, later so you can kind of catch up uh, on, on, on that. 
but I want to focus on the budget execution um, aspect. Um, so this is quite an important part or aspect uh, of the uh, PFM system. Um, the aim here is, of course, to attain or to achieve the policy goals. And you have a bit of the expenditure side and then the revenue side, and then what I will call the um, liquidity or cash flow um, management side of things. What we found as part of that uh, exercise a year and a half ago on the Ghana Beyond Aid Initiative was that uh, the revenue collection, we actually aren't doing super great on that, on that side, but the expenditure controls also, in some instances, they work, in others, um, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't um, work as well. And the reasons for that are, are quite, are quite, uh, are quite varied. And I will actually, um, uh, I will actually come to that. Sorry, I was just checking. I think somebody chat put a comment in there. So uh, says I don't know, but I cannot hear a word. Uh, sorry. Um, can you please hear? Can you all hear me? No, no, no. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, let me just check one thing. Just a second, please. I can hear you well. So, uh, before Dr. Chiu comes, please, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat box, please. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, Franklin, I can, I can hear you. I can okay. hear you as well, Spike. Please. All right, thank All right. you. Great. All right, sorry, I, I had to quickly, you know, pause and check that because I just seen some of the messages. So um, on, the, on the budget execution, there, there are big question marks uh, in a lot of the countries um, on both revenue collection and on the expenditure side uh, of, of the equation. I'll go into a few of the details uh, uh, to illustrate uh, um, uh, some, some of, of the point. But let me use an example here with um, uh, the financing of healthcare or health systems financing to perhaps you know um, uh, illustrate a point on how I think an alignment between um, the uh, PFM system, which is the means that we actually you know execute uh, these or finance these budgets, can be better aligned to meet um, the health financing goals. Uh, to uh, improve on, on outcomes. And by outcomes, I mean uh, on value for money and efficiency, both uh, allocative efficiency and operational efficiency to, uh, to talk about it in, like in, in, in technical uh, uh, terms. Um, so typically, you know, as you see on the right-hand side here, um, this is the cycle broken into about three components instead of six that I showed you from the budget to execution to, um, to monitoring. And what most robust PFM systems are able to do is to create a bit of a, a room or surgery that allows uh, uh, countries to make um, contingency appropriation. So for example, you could have a, a natural disaster or as we've had, we've had COVID which has come with uh, um, serious impacts on on both uh, the health front, but also on the on the um, on the on the economy um, overall. Um, and these emergency appropriations then need to be clearly targeted. So, for example, if it is you know healthcare um, uh, spending, then we need to not only um, find like offsetting savings. So we don't need to just redirect uh, money from one sector to, to the other. But most importantly, we should you know, um, ask uh, ourselves, how is this more geared towards improving um, outcomes? And how is this more geared in towards you know, enhancing um, efficiency? So it's not a question of just pouring money for, for its own sake or going to procure like you know, PPEs uh, uh, for frontline workers uh, or students per se, but does that or how is it connected to the wider um, uh, developmental um, objective in the, um, in the, um, in the healthcare uh, sector? So typically you tend to see that the Ministry of Finance um, um, guys, in my experience, 
would tend to identify sort of the emergency spending and then the emergency response mechanisms that are, are at their uh, disposal. In Ghana's case, we saw earlier the finance minister going to the to parliament to make proposals to take um, some monies from the um, the consolidated fund and then other other funding sources to meet uh, uh, the uh, the um, uh, the uh, or to mitigate the impact of of the pandemic. Um, so ideally, an alignment between the public financial management system and your health financing system can actually help you in terms of getting an, a single integrated cycle where both um, say the line ministry and the guys sitting at the level of the MOF, you know, have a singular purpose of, of view in mind. But there are challenges and the challenges often have to do with, yeah, how do you raise revenue? How do you pull resources? And how do you kind of make collective purchases um, to uh, increase on your um, economies of uh, scale and um, uh, 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 economies of scope. There are a little, there's a little challenge here. In a number of the countries, what you tend to find is that sometimes the budget itself and the PFM system itself is a bit rigid. So you have to earmark funds to um, sub-national entities. So to say, for example, your GET fund or um, uh, the insurance authority, things like that. And that tends, means then that you having to divert resources from those agencies is going against the letter and the spirit of the um, Public Financial Management Act or the, the wider system. So it's a bit of a challenge and then a, a balancing cycle here. But the point I really want to make is that both the um, line ministries and the um, the uh, agencies need to be um, thinking across the board in terms of the uh, response that have been given and how this response ultimately are connected to um, to uh, improving um, uh, uh, outcomes. I've just provided a link here. Uh, that was just a health example, but there are several more examples that one could look at. And for those interested on this uh, subject, if you go on the IMF website, they've gladly actually um, collated a number of uh, special notes uh, that deals with things like digitalization, um, how to run uh, state-owned enterprises uh, around fiscal rules, around budget controls, um, in public investment management, and then you know treasury management, all under that. Time wouldn't permit me to go into some of these you know granular details, but there are far more resources available for those interested uh, to uh, to uh, to go through or to look at some of these. Um, let me quickly run and skip through a bit, you know, on the on the audit bit. So I've dealt with the execution um, bit. I want to touch briefly on on the auditing and what can be can be done. I think in the post-COVID world, um, transparency, fiscal transparency and fiscal accountability is actually going to become far, far, far more um, important. Uh, as I mentioned that we have to make do with significantly less resources than you know, one uh, um, uh, would anticipate. So they have actually even been caused already uh, by uh, a number of these uh, public advocacy groups, such as transparency to you know, tie COVID-19 debt relief or aid relief you know, to uh, transparency um, uh, initiatives. And there's a nice statement from the, uh, the chair of the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board, uh, which um, is the global body that deals with uh, PFM, public sector accounting, that, you know, we need to have much <clears throat> more robust, strong systems, and um, you need to have a, a lot more um, transparency across the board. And one way that can be attained is through um, fiscal institutions. I will give you two examples. Uh, the first example being uh, fiscal councils, and then I'll talk about the like the um, audit bodies, uh, like Auditor General, etc. Um, so you can see on this chart here that post the 2008-9 financial crisis, 
a number of countries have actually moved to put in place uh, or institute fiscal councils um, to serve as a check on government um, spending, but also to ensure that there's broad alignment between the policy objectives outlined in the budgets uh, and say party manifestos to what uh, resources are actually ag available to execute um, these, uh, these um, objectives. So um, a number of countries uh, have moved to implement these, uh, these or such councils. Ghana most recently in the latter part of uh, 2018 passed such a law to set up a fiscal and a financial stability council in line with the trend that we had already seen um, happening in, in other jurisdictions. Two footnote points on that is that the effectiveness of, the, of such councils really hinges on whether or not they have um, autonomy to make uh, decisions and whether or not the composition of people who are appointed to such boards or councils, you know, are devolved from the political um, uh, 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 or executive uh, in interference. Um, if you look at the literature on this, it's quite clear that if you don't have these two key cardinal points in place, you can have these councils for all you want, but they don't still serve as a check on um, excessive uh, government uh, spending. And then on the auditing aspect, another interesting one is, I think the, the role of the audit or external audit body, bodies like the, um, like, uh, the Auditor General in, in Ghana's case, um, you can actually see that uh, because of the rollout of GIFMIS and then you know other um, PFM systems, the uh, the the um, the office of of the of, of the Auditor General and similar bodies have actually you know become much more proactive, and they become much more proactive in terms of using the PFM law and using other existing law to, you know, announce things like, like surcharges, you know, and, and to delete uh, uh, people on like the, on the payroll um, uh, system. Uh, again, the point here being that if we have to make do with less resources in a post COVID world, the role that such institutions play is absolutely vital and, you know, uh, quite important and they must be given all the um, uh, independence, they must be given all the autonomy to actually carry and execute um, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, mandate. Two slide points, uh, I think my time is running, so I'll take another three or four minutes and I'll, 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 uh, I'll round up uh, if, if you don't mind, because there's quite a number of things to go through. Um, let me go back to the, to the tax issue or the revenue issue and creating more um, fiscal space post COVID. I think a number of the countries on the continent have an opportunity uh, to, uh, to um, uh, through things like the di digitalization of both um, government services and frontline services, but across the wider economy to rope in the informal sector to um, increase uh, like the, the, the tax net. So with the exception of South Africa, I think Morocco and a few other ones that have a uh, tax to GDP ratio of a little over 20%. Several of the Sub-Saharan African countries are averaging 13, 14% um, uh, tax to, uh, to, uh, to GDP ratio. In Ghana's case, after the last um, rebasing of the economy, now it's just sitting a little over 12% uh, tax to GDP. But let me show you what that really means practically in terms of the revenue um, opportunity that this um, crisis offers us. We could actually go up to 20% tax, you know, to revenue um, GDP. But what that means in practical terms is that there's a room to actually raise as much as 8% of GDP or $5.2 billion or in Ghana City, about 25 billion Ghana City um, from um, uh, things like the digitalization, but enhancing um, the tax revenue uh, collection um, effort. Uh, I think I saw one estimate from the last Article 4 report uh, from um, on Ghana that said that the recent revenue mobilization initiatives will only 
meet about 1.5% of this. So there's still about a 6% you know, gap that needs to be filled. And what COVID has shown us is that we need to double up more or less our, our, our effort uh, on, on, this, on this front. Two quick points um, on, on the financing of the budget uh, from the monetary aspect. So, so far I've dealt with a lot of fiscal policy issues and the connection to the PFM. Just a little on the, um, on the monetary and the macro financial um, side, side, side of things, um, that we are likely to see far you know, greater involvement of uh, central banks in sub-Saharan Africa, as we saw you know, with the 08, 09 financial crisis, um, using the tools available to them to also support you know, the COVID um, and post-COVID uh, uh, response. And this can actually, um, on the expenditure side, on the fiscal side, we've talked about reduction in expenditures, creating more revenues, but it also could be through um, borrowing from uh, domestic um, uh, and, uh, and external resources. And in a number of the countries that have a central bank financing or act, the process for borrowing or which instruments the central bank can um, undertake this mandate is clearly outlined. So in Ghana's case, it's a combination of um, overdraft facilities, uh, but also um, uh, open market operations. So um, the central bank selling or buying government um, T-bills and, and other um, securities. The last point, going back to the fiscal issue, and this is coming back to Ghana, and the point that I reached or attached earlier on about having to make do with far less resources uh, in such times and beyond. I'm, I, I draw an interesting analogy between Ghana and, and Chile um, on the charts that you see on here. What we are measuring here is basically the rate of change in expenditure growth. So that's the, the deep gray line here. And then the rate of change in like the uh, revenue growth over time. And this goes back to 2001. What you can see in the case of Ghana, which is on your right hand chart, uh, side here, is that a lot of the fiscal policy making in, in Ghana, and certainly in a number of countries in Africa, is highly pro-cyclical. So what that means is that we tend to actually overspend during the boom times instead of, spend, uh, of saving. And then when disaster strikes, you know, or you have an external shock to the economy, um, we uh, struggle to, uh, to, to, to meet that. So you can see, you know, for, for Chile, right, which is a comparator country to Ghana. So Chile also has quite a big um, natural resource sector as well. You can see that despite the revenue, sorry, despite the expen uh, revenue growth, right, declining during like the last financial um, crisis, 08, 09, the country was actually able to maintain a consistent expenditure growth pattern. By running a counter cyclical um, fiscal policy tied to the overall objectives of the government because of course they had something like the, the sovereign wealth fund and other things in place to draw upon. But in the case of, of Ghana, you can see, you know, in 2008, big swing. Uh, uh, in 2001 to 2002, you know, revenue goes down, expenditure goes down. 2008, 2009, um, expenditure, uh, revenue, you know, uh, starts uh, going slightly up, uh, but expenditure growth comes down. And then most recently, during the, la the last, you know, um, uh, crisis that we had with Doomso and, and the commodity price cycle, you tend to see quite a, a number of, of, of this. So you ask yourself then, you know, despite uh, having introduced the, or to what extent would the new fiscal responsibility law that has been passed and the fiscal council help um, in mitigating some of these pro-cyclicalities that we see um, in, in, um, in Ghana and in a lot of the uh, sub-Saharan uh, African countries. In 2020, I certainly think that um, the act would not help us uh, to prevent any um, overspending. According to my sort of estimate or forecast, we are probably looking at 
you know, a deficit of uh, between 8 and 10% of GDP by the end of the year compared to 4.7% that was um, uh, originally estimated in the, in, the, in the 2020 budget. So what are my concluding thoughts or, or broad points in here that I want to leave us with? I think, number one, there are significant uncertainties about the nature of the post-COVID recovery, and this has an impact on sub-Saharan African economies. Um, my, my money is you know, on a kind of a U-shaped uh, uh, recovery, pending or subject to um, a vaccine being found for, for this virus. Um, what COVID has exposed to us is that there are fundamental structural weaknesses in a lot of the sub-Saharan African economies. And that's because we failed to diversify, we've had a commodities boom, and we didn't use those resources as well enough as we, as we could. In a number of the countries, certainly in Ghana, um, fiscal policy making is highly and notably pro-cyclical, and that's related to both commodities and then the electoral um, or elections um, cycle. And in such an instant, your um, responsibility act or the financial laws may not be able to prevent um, uh, on over overspending. Post COVID, I think the budgets or the conversation in, in Africa needs to move away from this input, let's get more money and put it into healthcare, buy more um, boots, buy more cars, etc. More now to actually a conversation around outcomes and outputs. And this actually should be based, based on my experience on a, a coherent kind of theory of change. So how are those cars, how are those expenditures going to actually help at the end of the day to improve, say, healthcare or education or social you know, outcomes across the board? And how do we actually measure these outcomes on a, you know, uh, on a year by year or whatever um, time basis that we choose? And that would then help us to both tackle poverty, inequality, there's opportunities to pursue digitalization, and even like the green growth, you know, uh, uh, agenda now in, in a number of, of, of countries. For the public procurement systems itself, uh, it, it goes without saying, um, and this has been made extensively, there's a need to strengthen these systems, backed by effective internal and external audit with a strong sanctions um, regime in place. Other than that, we'll be pouring more, um, more resources into uh, a leaking basket. And it is in this vein that I think that the work that institutions like the Auditor General um, in a lot of these countries uh, perform is absolutely vital and we must do all we can to safeguard the, the work of, of such um, uh, institutions, especially around you know, making sure that both the allocative and operational efficiency uh, on things like value for money um, are met to ensure um, budget uh, credibility. For civil society, I think we also have a role to play. So um, in, in relation to the calls for more transparency and more anti-corruption measures uh, on COVID uh, relief funding, I think civil society has a voice here to you know, bring some of these issues to the fore and you know, ask the fundamental questions around how have the monies been disbursed? In what areas have they been used? And how are they connected to um, such uh, outcomes? So that's a bit more of a proactiveness that, that we, 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 uh, we, we need here. And central banks would also play a bit of a role on the you know, deficit financing. And just to my final point there being that uh, Africa has a tremendous opportunity to borrow the quote leapfrogging word, you know, uh, through things like uh, enhanced um, digitalization on the governance and government side of things, but also on the private sector side of things to rope in more people into, into the tax net. So with that, I thank you. I know I've run a little bit over the time, um, but I just thought perhaps, you know, I take a bit of time to explain some of these concepts uh, to, to, to us. So more than happy to, uh, to take um, questions and I hope it's been useful. Well, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much, Dr. Theo. Um, I think we have about 20, 25 minutes. We can do that for Q&A. Um, the two things that jumped at me listening to you 
and as always has been the issues around uh, prudence and uh, um, sound public policy making. I think you even touched on the issues of pragmatism in this very COVID times as well. Let me put you on the spot first, by the way. You know, uh, our finance minister, when he wrote in the Financial Times of London, uh, suggested that he was green-eyed and with envy because countries that were a bit poorer than us were getting all the major reliefs and that he thought that Ghana should get the same as well. Uh, but then I wondered, because I thought that we had a bit of meat on the bone, uh, but we were not particularly, you know, being very prudent. Question I have for you. Just as we're asking for debt standstill, what are some of the expenditure items would you think could also be stayed or has been occasioned as a result of COVID that we could, you know, reassign in your own ways, um, uh, well, of course, the point is to be able to stand still them and then that's, those expenditures can be used profitably. The second question I have for you is that as a trade and investment advocate for countries like Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa, do you see the sense that Ghana has enough clout again after, after COVID to be able to attract FDI? I think you should think about these two. Um, so maybe you want to answer that before I bring some of the questions that have been asked on, in the chat room. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, on the first bit, I think, yes, there's clearly a scope to um, rationalize expenditure. So interestingly, if you look at, uh, for example, Ghana's 2020 budget and you go to the very last pages of the budget in the appendix, it gives you what they call the summary of government um, operations. And it gives you line by line um, what the uh, appropriations um, or um, amount to a specific sectors and line ministries are. I think the government actually showed a bit of initiative by reducing the, uh, the budget on goods and services. Um, I don't have the exact amount off the top of, of my head. But when I actually looked at that in relation to the, act, the budget amount, I felt that perhaps there was a bit of room to further you know, reduce uh, or cut back on some of those uh, spendings. Um, especially also when you look at like the General Office of Government Machinery and the amount of monies that are spent, I, I am yet to see any um, report specifically that looks at the efficiency of spending, you know, within these, you know, uh, government machinery. So I'm not talking about frontline ministries. I'm talking about, you know, going to the level of like the, uh, the presidency and the, some of the other agencies that fall underneath that. I think perhaps there's opportunity to do a bit more um, on that. But there are trade-offs. The trade-offs especially is you know, from a political economy angle is, well, you have an election around the corner and typically, as I showed you, most governments uh, tend to overspend um, in, 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 in elections. So it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult balancing act, but there are certainly line items in the budget that uh, can be further rationalized. Another example is some of the state-owned um, enterprises or companies. Um, there has been an attempt to reform like the governance process at these um, uh, SOEs and that was even sort of prior to COVID. Um, but again, I think the amounts of monies that uh, are allocated to some of these SOEs, we actually need to ask fundamental questions about how they are utilizing and using these monies. I've been involved in a bit of work on, on one of them, which is the uh, the uh, the national oil company for Ghana, and the results are you know kind of uh, interesting without going into uh, a bit more detail. But there are opportunity again in here around with uh, the SOEs and contingent liabilities and what that means for the the budget uh, overall. Um, your second question on uh, trade and investment and the clout or the ability of Ghana to attract FDI, I think that is sort of um, beyond doubt. So you can see um, pre-COVID, the FDI inflows actually in nominal terms um, were uh, increasing and the numbers had actually kind of like 
gone up um, year on year. And partly that reflects a lot of the moves that have been taken by several of the, of the government in the last several years to go on a massive investment drive to um, attract F FDI. In the sub-region, we are competing for capital with our original peers, so Cote d'Ivoire next door, Nigeria, you know, et cetera. Um, I think what we can do realistically and what COVID also offers is for us to um, improve our ease of doing business. So the regulatory um, um, uh, bureaucratic red tape that often accompany some of these things um, tend to also add or increase the cost of uh, or your, the, the discount factor that you apply to some of these um, uh, investments. So the digitalization initiatives at the ports, et cetera, they are useful and you know, go some way to help, but far, far more can be done uh, to generate a lot more um, uh, internal uh, resources without, of course, supplemented by you know, uh, improved FDI flows. Well, I mean, um, let me be daring once again. I think in your earlier paper you wrote, you co-authored with Patrick, um, you posed a question, which I thought was very uh, important, that if we were going to spend um, an estimated almost 9.5 billion, oh, actually 10 billion cities in, uh, in, in bringing back the financial institutions that were moribund, then it meant that if the government was positing that they were going to spend close to 9.5 billion or a little bit more, about 10 to 11 billion cities in the corona uh, alleviation program, um, it means that we can, actually, we can actually be prudent and that we can, we can look at all these interventions we've made and not decide to you know, uh, shortchange our own gains that we've made. You did suggest at the point at that time that there were certain fiscal and monetary measures that were being adopted that you thought could be stayed. Um, I'm putting you on the spot again. This is related to the oil sector. Um, what were you saying at the time that we shouldn't do? Because oh, I mean, <laughs> thank you. It was just two things. Uh, I, I said that we shouldn't rush to go and amend the PRMA to want to go and tap into the, uh, into the heritage uh, fund you know, for uh, COVID relief. Because uh, if you look at the schematic, uh, for every 100 um, CD that comes in as revenue, about 70 CDs goes to the budget directly, and then 21 CDs uh, goes to the stabilization fund, whose purpose is precisely meant to deal with, you know, issues as we've seen with COVID and the oil price downfall. So collectively, both the budget the stabilization fund is 91 CDs out of 100 CD of revenue you're getting. And if you've not been able to use the 91 uh, all too well, as the evidence shows in the various um, PIAC reports, et cetera, then of what use would nine CDs do for you? That's like a drop uh, in, the, in the ocean, okay. especially given that nine CD is meant for um, you know, intergenerational equity in the in the heritage fund so that was one number two i also suggested that the we i'm not in favor personally of going to amend the bank of ghana act to remove the net zero uh, domestic financing requirement because that's like kicking a can opening a can of worms and we've been down this road before uh in the last kind of 10 years where uh, at one point it was like 10 percent deficit financing and if you look at the data consistently, we were doing sometimes 12, 15% deficit financing. In the last IMF program that we exited, um, that came down to uh, uh, 5%, and then gradually it was sort of dealt away uh, with. Um, and I'm, I, I raised or suggested that if we're to go this route, we are opening a big Pandora's box with an election around the corner where, again, the evidence shows that we tend to overspend, you know, um, during uh, such cycles. We're better off not touching these two laws and let's find ways and means to actually deal or do with, you know, the resources that we actually have uh, uh, in country. Right. So, well, I have two questions from two great journalist friends of mine. They are financial journalists, George Riafi of Joy FM Multimedia. He wants to find out what should be the fiscal approach for the next half of the year, taking into consideration how COVID-19 is impacting the economy, 
Then he asks a follow-up question. Do I get from you that the fiscal council has failed or cannot do anything? Check our budget overruns. And, and I'll make a statement after that when you've answered this question. Sure. Let me tackle the last one first. I did not say that Ghana's fiscal council specifically has failed. I mean, it's only been in operation for less than a, a year. So it would be a bit of an unfair assessment to, uh, to do or to make. Rather, what I said is that the evidence shows that if these councils are to be effective, then you need to make sure that the people you appoint to those boards uh, have, are independent. And number two, the council or the body itself is independent of executive authority, right? So if you look at how like the Office for Budget Responsibility um, works in the UK or in the US, the Congressional, I think, Budget Office, and there are a few of such examples dotted, you tend to see that when they speak or come out with a certain forecast, both sides of the political divide, you know, listens to them because they've actually built up that credibility and they've actually built up, you know, a bit of um, social capital. But if you don't have these two at the core, then, you know, we would have this council uh, in place. However, it wouldn't, you know, serve us in the, in the long term. And also a little footnote to that is that um, with COVID, um, we were, oh, because of the revenue shortfall anyway, we are having to overspend the budget ceiling, the 5% budget ceiling um, stipulated in the, um, uh, in the PFM uh, Act. The question was how far or can we actually go? When we run some of the numbers and we said, you know, if you did a bit more savings on your uh, goods and services budget, um, you know, better um, financing or better reform of the SOEs, you could actually run a deficit of around 6% of GDP um, rather than now the 8 to 10% that we're, we're looking at. Um, I don't know to what extent the fiscal council that we just set up influenced those uh, decisions because I, I, I just don't know. But more broadly, um, the evidence just shows that if you have the council to, or you need a council to work, then they need to be uh, independent and the institution itself needs to be independent of uh, um, the executive uh, um, inter interference. Okay. And I think the first question was on- um, I think you answered that much, much- uh, Financing uh, of yeah. the budget. Yeah, the, the little so point there is that we, yeah. just, we should just be more prudent. That's all that I, I would say. And right. I realize it's difficult because you know, uh, election. I was talking to a, a friend of mine who works in government in one of the African countries who said, look, my brother, uh, right now we're thinking about survival and how to win the last election. We think about deficit and, and you know, prudence after we win the election. And I thought that was poignant. It is indeed. L let me, uh, before I go to Richard Dabi, another great financial journalist friend of mine, I'd like to uh, call on the IMF country director, uh, Dr. Albert Tumamana, uh, who just was a while ago. I think he has some uh, insights or questions. Sure. sure. Uh, thank you, Franklin, uh, uh, for having me. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to uh, to join this uh, this forum. So you know, when when I saw that this was planned, I, I tried to make time to uh, to join. This was a great presentation. I'm also quite encouraged to see that uh, you know the material that we put out there is 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 uh, is actually useful um, to for for this kind of purpose. I had a few comments, not necessarily questions um, about uh, the presentation. I think that. They, I mean, it's very educative, and, and there are a lot of information uh, that that you actually put out there. Let me first start by, um, you know, the the picture that you paint of um, emergency financing delivered to uh, African countries or to countries in general. I think is the first thing is uh, it's important to understand that. The COVID, which is a COVID-related crisis, which is an unprecedented crisis, uh, is the perfect storm for Africa, irrespective of what the starting point was. You have uh, several channels through which 
uh, most countries, uh, whether they had enough buffers or not, will have been affected. And I think you, you touch on uh, several of, of, of these points. Uh, when you take the collapse in global demand, when you take, um, uh, when you take uh, the collapse in tourism, uh, you know, capital outflows, um, the restrictive measures that have been put in place to deal with the, the health crisis itself, from lockdown to, to other measures, these are a set of, of, of and of course, commodity prices. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is very little space for countries on the continent not to be affected. And something that I think the presentation did not mention is that uh, we were already warning countries, uh, you know, in the last few years of increasing debt and uh, very li little fiscal space. And this, this actually goes beyond, beyond Ghana. So this is the perfect terrain. And, um, you know, so it's not a surprise to some extent that most of the countries on, on this chart are actually requesting for emergency financing. Uh, let me also point out to the fact that more than 100 countries have, have requested, right? So this is still uh, uh, incomplete because some countries are, are still working on it. South Africa, for example, that is not on this chart, is currently discussing with the IMF to, uh, for emergency financing. So this chart will look uh, quite uh, uh, differently, will be quite different in, in, in a few weeks uh, from now. So what we've seen is Countries that are, I mean, if, if you know a bit the history of South Africa, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, it will take a major shock for South Africa to come to the front, right? So they are coming to the front and, and this is in, in, in progress. Nigeria hasn't had many uh, emergency financing. They also came to request. So I want to dispel the, the, the impression that, uh, you know, this is just uh, emergency financing for the weakest countries. Of course, South Africa had its own challenges, but this is an unprecedented shock. The second point, and I think that you, 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 uh, you save it towards the end, I think there was a lot of focus on, on uh, uh, you know, expenditure rationalization. Of course, it's a very important point. Um, we, we tend to, to give, uh, more uh, prominence to fiscal consolidation through uh, better domestic revenue mobilization. I think you spent some time on that towards the end of the presentation, so I, I won't say more, but I think that it's underrated. But I think in the case of Ghana, we can clearly see that, um, you know, the upside of broadening the tax base, and I think that this crisis is, is making the point that um, there is a relevance to to give, uh, you know, to, to be tax compliant uh, for cases where, you know, like that, where the government is, is, is basically playing uh, the role of, of, uh, of uh, you know, coming to the rescue. Of course, the money needs to be spent well, but I think the, the, the argument for uh, reinforcing tax compliance is made exactly in this type of situation where there is no insurance policy that can deal with uh, the magnitude of this shock, except through, through uh, central government. Finally, on, on um, how to address, uh, you know, what's the best way uh, to have oversight over emergency financing? Um, I think that, you know, we first, you know, you, um, what we say as an institution is that, you know, we've, we've put some money to, uh, um, to help finance uh, the additional or the incremental uh, health uh, uh, demands or health expenditure. But what we like to see uh, or what we are asking countries is, is to keep the receipt. That's, that's the way we are putting that because we, we may want to see it. And, uh, you know, I can share more material on what we've been doing uh, in that aspect. In the case of Ghana, our thinking was always that um, the, the framework, the framework to uh, monitor spending uh, was, was strong from, you know, not only the parliament uh, uh, oversight, but also uh, from, you know, the audit service uh, uh, in general. So this framework was already in place. 
and this framework should be used to the full extent uh, to provide transparency to, to, uh, to, of course, audit spending, especially uh, uh, emergency spending that came because of, of the COVID. And uh, basically, there is really no need, in my view, right, in this circumstance to create another body, which is a fiscal council, right? I think you already have an emergency, especially in a context uh, like Ghana. There is, uh, you know, the, the framework that is there is, is strong enough, of course, there is a fiscal council in Ghana. It's an, an additional layer that can also help, but the, the existing regulation, the existing institution should actually play their role. So what we, we, um, we recommend in this case is as much as possible to implement and, and publicize both internal and external audits. And that's, that's what we've been pushing uh, around the continent and, and, and beyond for countries that have been uh, accessing our emergency financing. So I'll stop here. Uh, thanks again for the presentation and uh, you know, looking forward for uh, further discussion. Over. Thank you very much, Albert. And I'd like to just say that uh, thank you for your wonderful support over the course of uh, your time here. I recall in February you had wanted uh, myself to join some other African ministers to discuss good governance and the fight against corruption in, in Africa, uh, as if you were clairvoyant. And so you saw some of these challenges that uh, Dr. Tia Champon has mentioned. Thank you very much for your friendship again. Um, I'm sure uh, Theo would want to say something about that. But before then, um, I'd just like to say that Richard Abbey, who I mentioned a while back, uh, wanted to ask a direct question. He says he wants to clarify, he wants some clarity. Are you still saying that the deficit target would have been, still have been missed even without the attendant impact of COVID? I, I don't think I heard that, um, but I'm sure you would want to say something about that. Before you comes in again, um, Julius Su, our old uncle Julius Su, uh, asked a very interesting question. Can audits be done in real time, given all the challenges we have? I suspect that question could be answered by our own good friend, Domelevo, who is listening in, um, as well as uh, Beauty Nathi, who is the executive director of GACC. Um, even our own Ben Bachi, who is the executive director of ASAP, who are all on call. Guys, if you want to make an intervention, please uh, raise your hands and I'll let you do that. Um, otherwise, the, there are a few other questions here. So you please note them. Um, someone just asked, I think Joyce Daniel. Uh, she says, I feel COVID-19 has a good side. We are out now trying to be innovative. Our thinking faculties are now in full gear. I'm highly impressed with how some private schools have embraced the virtual learning, but how about our public schools? Learning seems to have ended as some areas cannot follow the TV sessions introduced. Not all have televisions, and they, if they do, what about the electricity bills? They will no longer have free ECG running their meters, because that, that's more of a comment. Um, Richard Abbey again says, and given that revenue from oil has been hit severely, how do you see us navigating some of the rigidities in our budget, such as spending on flagship programs like the free SHS? Do you think it is the right time to reassess how that policy is implemented that has allowed those who can afford to pay their bits? Theo, you see, you dodged the question <laughs> the last time. When I asked you, you, you wanted to dodge it. I'm grateful for Richard, and I'll end it here now. Uh, now, now you are put on the spot. You can make it to all you want, but uh, I'm sure... Richard wants you to ask a very important question. Uh, I, I know, I know. And that, that would make for an interesting uh, news headline, I suppose. Oh, you know <laughs> the first. I think the finance minister himself suggested a while yeah. ago that he thinks, yeah. So, uh, but more, not just on free SHS. Essentially, he's suggesting to you or asking if there are any uh, programs that could be reviewed. I recall Patrick had written a paper. I'd asked him to write the paper. Patrick Stevenson, by the way. I'd asked him to write a paper on the essence of the um, government's uh, job creation program. What is it called again, NAPCO? NAPCO. And his evaluation at the end of the day showed that if it is not going to return value, then we need to reassess it as well. You may want to posit your answers within that light. Yeah, sure. I can make a few quick comments and then um, the others can also um, chip in. 
Uh, so on the first run of what the deficit target had been missed, even um, without COVID, I think that was always a possibility. I think the last time we ran, or I ran the numbers uh, um, on, the, on the economy, we were looking at just a little over 5% of GDP uh, deficit. So it would have been marginally within the, um, within the, um, the bounds set by the uh, PFM uh, Act. Um, and so that kind of was the situation we were looking at um, pre-COVID five to five and a half percent um, 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 deficit. Um, but of course, what COVID then has done with the loss of the revenue um, is created a much bigger um, funding gap. Um, and, and so we've now had to resort to a few other um, sources to, to plug that, that gap. But like I said earlier, I think that even with the gap that existed, we could still have pursued a few of these um, rationalization initiatives, which ties into the second question on, on NAPCO, free SHS, 1D, 1F, all of that, to more or less reduce you know, how big that would be. And the initial estimate of the numbers um, I ran was that um, some of these um, savings could actually then mean that you probably would run a little under, um, you know, six, six and a half percent of a deficit. So that's 1.5 percent less than the original 5 percent target as compared to um, now, which we're expecting about eight to, you know, um, 10 percent uh, deficit uh, um, spending. Uh, what is interesting uh, to note is that in the, I think in the, in the law, there's a bit of room um, to trigger these um, emergency um, provisions, but there was no, um, there's no additional detail on how you actually go about doing it and how far you can actually go to spend your way um, out out of the crisis. So certainly, I think that they would have maintained those um, uh, deficit numbers uh, just around the the target in the PFM Act, but with COVID, is going to be far far bigger um, as uh, anticipated. Uh, the question of uh, spending in other areas. I also think that um, a program like NAPCO um, can and should be reviewed. Um, okay. I think it's been implemented a number of, uh, of months now, especially uh -huh. in a situation where, you know, you're facing um, uh, significant um, budgetary okay. winf uh, sorry, uh, gaps. So instead of maybe rolling it out across, you know, the number of persons that had been anticipated by the end of the year, it could actually be staged, you know, and in a staged manner, then assess what is the impact of one, the, like the skills training and all the things that the um, young students have gotten on like enhancing their livelihood enhancement opportunities. What I have seen historically happen in Ghana, and this is not any criticism of NAVCO, we tend to run these programs without any proper M&E mechanism, monitoring and evaluation, tracking mechanisms attached to it. And so we throw, like I said, more money down the drain, but very little in terms of, uh, of outcomes. Free SHS is a bit tricky, I must say, because um, look, at the end of the day, the political reality is that it's one of like the government's flagship initiatives and probably the election may even be campaigned around things like that. So um, I struggled to see how they would scale back on, 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 that, on that funding um, aspect. To be fair to you, um, when I put you on the spot of free SHS, what we did say in that paper you published earlier was that if school was going to be postponed as, at the time, then it meant that some of the savings in terms of feeding the students could have been used in other areas. So um, that's fair. Let me say that Kosifia, and we have just about eight minutes to go. Kosifia asked a question earlier about the rigidities that are inherent in the economy as a result of COVID, um, whether the PFM provision that are not deficit should be, should not exceed 5% should have not be. I think you've answered the question already. Um, so Francis Beidou, Actually, I also ask a question. You made mention that many liquidity stimuli have been initiated, especially in Ghana, basically through commercial banks, but, of, but unfortunately without specific stringent lending 
directives. Data shows that a chunk of the credit funding in Ghana goes to real estate and importation. Um, do you think the intent of this liquidity stimuli would be achieved, especially in Ghana, given the technical practice of commercial banks? Um, so please note that question. I think that um, someone says, Kwame Esid actually says, do you, I think the politics is the main reason why we do not convert our inputs into tangible outcomes. Outcomes are soft measures that do not win votes immediately. Inputs and outputs do. Unless society does more to track the outcome, then citizens won't care. I've done some work on many other health outcomes and the picture is clear. Kwame will be grateful to, oh, this Kwame you see, you are our own Kwame. Um, yes, beautiful. Yes, we should. And I think we've been doing that as well with manifesto tracking. I must admit that the coming elections would also mean opportunities to put questions directly to these politicians as to what they will do when they have the presence of mind to be prudent. Um, so I'll let you answer those questions. Uh, did I see some hands? Actually, yeah, I think maybe we we'll let uh, the other people you mentioned they have, have some comments to make. Yes, I mentioned I quite a number of persons, yes. um, including yourself. Me and Arabia, I'll come to you briefly. But um, uh, Ben Bachi is on. Um, uh, uh, Beatrice is on. Um, I don't know if the Malibu wants to make any comment. But, uh, hello, 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 Franklin. Yes, please. Yeah, um, this is Kwame. Um, yeah, please, please. Yes. Um, thanks, Theo. That this has been very, very educative, and I must own up. When I was doing that piece of work on the health outcome indicators, Theo was one of my points of call in February, so he's aware of what Kwame, I'm talking Kwame, about. Kwame, not many, Kwame, not many people know you. I know you are a doctor, you are a pharmacist, you are a policy guru, but you're also a senior fellow, as you are a fellow of the CDD. That's what we know about you. And we know you are a prolific activist when it comes to, in fact, you are the only last man standing monitoring the COVID numbers. Some of us have given up, <laughs> but we are grateful. Yeah, thanks, Franklin. Yeah, like I was saying, um, in the civil society space, there's a lot of collaboration. Like I said earlier, when I was working on the numbers when it comes to our outcomes, Phil was very helpful back in January, February. And at that time, little did we know that COVID was going to be this devastating. But the bigger point I was trying to make is the fact that in any society, anything that is not measured is never achieved. So as long as we allow the politicians to say, oh, I built a hospital, can't you see it there? I built a road, can't you see it there? Without saying, okay, you built a road, how many deaths did it prevent? How many accidents did it prevent? You built a hospital, what, how much did they cut maternal mortality? You increased health expenditure per capita to like Theo said in 2013, the NDC increased to $111, which is the highest Ghana has achieved since independence. Mm. What was maternal mortality? What was under five mortality? What was, um, what do you call it, our immunization percentage? And we look at it and say, what in, in, at the end of the day, how did it impact on our quality adjusted life years and improve our life expectancy? If we don't ask those questions and we continue to make the politicians say, I built a hospital, I built a road, we're not going to get anywhere. We are just going to throw uh, money away. But more importantly, what benefits us as voters is the outcome. And sadly, we have shared that responsibility to track it. And that was all I wanted to say. Well, beautiful. I think Patrick makes a comment to that. Um, it's akin to it, really. He says, these social intervention programs are not considered within the broad architecture of labor market inefficiencies and private sector lending. Oh, private sector leading, lending, leading the drive for the development of the country. To this end, they will continue to be a strain on the economy. Um, actually says, government is considering revamping local manufacturing. How should they approach this, especially in light of the high cost of power and huge debts in the energy sector? In fact, Nini makes a complimentary comment. Um, no, actually, on un complimentary comment about the dual role of minister MPs in parliament. I suspect that comment was made on the back of the ability to, you know, monitor government expenditure, right? Um, Beauty said he had to go for another meeting. I think I know about that meeting. Um, but anyway, the, there are quite a number of comments. Um, 
Looking at the risk associated with COVID-19 expenditure, loans and revenue shortfalls in election year spending, are the right decisions being made by government of Ghana? This I think Bonn, who asked that question. Um, then there was, um, okay. Osai Amankwa, for clarity, are you saying the Fiscal Council, which is to ensure fiscal and debt sustainability, will do little in these times of COVID, considering the makeup? Um, I'm not too sure he said that. Um, I think the Albert, the IMF, the country director, made mention of something to that extent as well. But anyway, um, do, you, do you have comments to make? Someone, before you come in, someone say hi to you, insightful presentation, Dennis JJ, right away. On central bank financing, how is that going to impact macro stability, given that such financing will likely increase money supply within the economy? Okay, so please uh, marry all of these uh, responses to your concluding thoughts, and then um, I'll have uh, I'll, I'll thank everybody as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean on the last one on central bank um, uh, financing, um, yes, it would um, increase money supply, but I think the broader policy objective, if you look at it in a classical um, sort of uh, Keynesian approach would be to stimulate aggregate demand um, and to uh, get more or less reject the economy going. And remember, it's only supporting what uh, the Ministry of Finance is also doing on the on the fiscal uh, front. And both of these need to go hand in hand uh, for, for that to be effective. Uh, what is quite interesting when you look at Ghana's um, data over the years is that at least in the last couple of years, uh, probably starting about 2016 onwards, we've seen much more better coordination in terms of the monetary and you know um, and the fiscal policy, and and that outcome is partly reflected in the um, inflation targeting framework that you know we have in place. So at the end of the or during the budget, they they will give you you know want to maintain inflation eight plus or minus. A certain percentage point, and you can see broadly that has sort of, you know, been the approach that they have been um, uh, um, working um, uh, within. But the, there are bigger issues that you know we have to deal with. So away from all the technical jargon and you know aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and you know um, money supply, there are real issues of how do you actually create jobs in the system without some of these, what I call, in quotes, you know, uh, tokenist measures like NAPCO, et cetera. Um, there, there are fundamental problems um, that need to be uh, addressed on youth employment, which is the biggest issue in my estimation that we face um, uh, uh, as a country. Um, and there are issues on the fiscal side about, we need to spend our monies much more wisely and as Kwame said, they have to be outcomes driven uh, rather than um, uh, inputs uh, driven. Uh, to Nene's point about the energy sector, uh, that's another perhaps webinar on its own. <laughs> There's a lot that we can actually say about the uh, persistent indebtedness uh, in, the, in the sector. Despite you know, recent moves like the energy recovery um, program and the cash waterfall mechanism that has been um, uh, um, uh, it, it introduced, um, there are still structural issues in the sector that is making the cost of power far more um, uh, expensive than would be the case, you know, to drive our um, industrialization drive. But I'll leave the comments on the energy sector more broad for now, and maybe another time we can come and do a much more detailed deep dive on the on the issues in the sector. Perhaps maybe if Ben is still on, he may comment on the energy sector as well. Well, Ben, um, I'll call on him. Um, ben is very conservative. Uh, if you don't call him, he doesn't want to talk. <laughs> but I'll put him on the spot. That's our Ben. <laughs> I put him on the spot, I'd like to say that you said something a while ago about budget overruns. Um, oh, okay, let's let Ben come in and then, uh, Ben, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, thanks, Franklin. And sorry, I didn't join early, so I was struggling to fit in, so I don't repeat what has been said um, already. 
Um, I think a couple of issues. Um, when it comes to um, the running of a country's budget and its expenditures, um, you can't always assume that things will go as you plan. And that is why issues of contingency is quite relevant. Uh, we have uh, an arrangement within the constitution for us to have an emergency package, which allows us to respond quickly to emergency. You may not be able to adequately plan for a situation like COVID, which is much more demanding. So you can have a buffer like $1 billion sitting there. But what should kick you immediately into motion in addressing the challenges before you look for additional support? As a country, you must have it. And we were exposed badly to realize that in the face of COVID, we had zero balance in our contingency plan. You know, and therefore, uh, we had to uh, quickly now move money uh, uh, from the oil funds to be able to uh, uh, provide. And that also took time because you needed approval from uh, parliament you know, to, to be able to do that. But if we had the contingency plan, you'd have only needed uh, uh, the Finance Committee of Parliament to approve that and get uh, things done uh, quickly. You cannot rely on external support to address contingency uh, from the start, and we have to pay attention to that. The energy sector challenges, I mean, for me, sometimes we talk about some few millions missing here and there, but when you sit and you look at the leakage and the wastage, uh, it's so alarming. You, you're looking at projects like Eastern Corridor Road, and we fancifully talk about it year after year. And at one point, we were sinking as much as $100 million, you know, a month, <laughs> you know, for the energy sector inefficiencies uh, uh, and payments, unwarranted payments of that. Uh, we can be more efficient at tightening some of those, those loose ends, uh, ensuring that the contracts are right, uh, where we need to cut the waste and bear the brunt, we do so and do that quickly. Uh, and, and all of that has had implication for our inability to respond adequately because the liabilities are still there. And you recall that the finance minister wrote a piece, you know, in Financial Times complaining mm -hmm. about a company, uh, you know, actioning its letters of credit and guarantees with the World Bank when mm -hmm. we're in the COVID situation. But the gas has to be produced ultimately. If somebody produces gas, uh, the gas is sold to the power sector and the money doesn't come back. Do you blame the producer of the gas or your inability to fix the power sector problem, uh, fix the distribution end? Because you and I, we pay our bills. So who is not collecting the revenue or who is man mismanaging the revenue for which reason we are not able to pay for the gas? That is a critical concern that we have to address. If we do not address some of those wastage recovery will take a long while because we are still paying for capacity charges we're still paying for non-collection because if you're not able to collect the revenue government is the ultimate guarantor of all these uh, power plants and the energy sector so government has to pay so what's supposed to go to build the schools uh, support industry and support small businesses you end up doling out those money to pay for power that has been consumed by some people or uh, uh, by failure of the agencies of state to actually perform uh, their function to be able to save us uh, 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 all of that. So uh, like you said, it's a bigger conversation uh, to be had, but uh, we have to be more prudent and ensure that some of those who wasted in the energy sector can be curtailed. Well, Dr. Ben Boachi, he's the Executive Director of ASAP, ASAP the Legion Energy Think Tank on the continent. Um, let me just say that all of you have said quite a lot, and I suspect that in this times, prudence is the watchword. In the, indeed, you can have all the value for money, permutations, modeling, and what have you, but if we do not replace nepotism, uh, corruption, and collusion with meritocracy, pragmatism, and honesty in public office, then you'd have challenges, without a doubt. And on that, you suggested that somebody needs to do some work on the Office of Government Machinery. Where I believe that's where all the corruption sits. There's no qualms about that. If you look at the government, Office of Government Machinery, not just with this government, the successor government, that's where all the budget overruns sit. And in 2017, Imani did a 
and analysis of budget overruns uh, for the Office of Government Machinery. What this government has cleverly done is that because they have, because they know that we, as this previous overruns were used politically against the previous administration, they actually now accommodated the overruns. So you see 1.5 billion in 2017 to 3 billion in 2018. And this year alone, I think the um, chairman of the finance committee suggested that the Office of Government Machinery has spent 3.5 billion. That is where the dam sits, one village, one dam, which are said to be dug out, actually sit. So that's where the problem sits. But on this conversation, we have great persons like my good friend, Prince Moses, who used to be the online editor of the Africa Report, but is also now a very senior person in the Ministry of Finance. He's taking notes, and I'm sure that everything you said will be shared with the ministry. I noticed a few people from the Ministry of Finance as well on the call, and it'll be useful to have them as well. Let me just thank everybody. Thank the TO as always. And thank everybody who contributed, Albert and everyone else who is in the leading role. Um, I thank Nafi and the gang from Nash the Resource Governance Institute, um, our colleagues from GCC, our friends who joined in as well. Let me just say that there's going to be another webinar after the budget is read, Professor Buckwin. And if you would have made the time, you would probably anchor that particular program for us. But let me just also add finally that Imani is planning a presidential, we, I, I don't like to call it a presidential debate. In the light of all that has been discussed right now, today, it looks as if we need to chart a new path for encouraging growth goals that would unlock our potential as a, as, as a country. She has talked about digitalization. We need to start asking our candidates if are the new ones including those who want to be, well, got the independent candidates as well as the minority parties. Because I think they also have very good ideas that they need to bring on board. We are planning something like that and you get to know within the next week or two. Thank everybody. Thanks particularly goes to um, uh, Enokose, who has been very instrumental in setting this up uh, technologically. Uh, thanks to the Imani team for helping out in all of this. And I hope you took notes that you would prepare questions for, to ask our presidential candidate, hopefuls, by the way. Thank you, everyone, again. Thanks for staying on. I'll see you. So, I think just the last one, the slides will be made available on the Imani website. Yes. So you can, exactly. yes, it will be publicly accessible. Actually, the slides have been shared by Enoch already. Um, oh, okay. And the people, the, the, so everybody can take a look at it and download. Thank you very much again. Thanks. Bye-bye.